It's incredibly difficult to live a fulfilling life while being so focused on trying to please all the people around you. The fear of those close to you disapproving of how you think and act can be crippling. But sometimes, when you show people what it means to move past those fears, it can not only significantly improve your life, allowing you to express your true self, but even improve the lives of those you fear disappointing. This was something Akaru Inoue was slowly starting to see after making a bond with his Bayunite creature partner, Hopolima. After Akaru had spent weeks with his new friend, Agama Knight, learning to connect more with nature and with his authentic self, this four-foot-tall stone golem Bayunite had wandered out of the woods and merged with Akaru's body. So long as he could keep living authentically and keep his body's vibration on par with this creature, they'd be partners for life. But that would be difficult to do in Akaru's family and community. His father, Dai Inoue, worked for the Averitt Corporation, which made the bond bands that could essentially trick Bayunites into bonding with someone. That company had, not just its employees, but most of the island country of Unitalia, convinced that it was dangerous to make a natural and authentic bond with a Bayunite, and the only safe way to do it was with one of their expensive bands. Akaru's dad had wanted a bond band himself when he was younger, but couldn't afford the price of living in Unitalia, let alone the price of a bond band. Now as an adult, he made plenty of money working for the Averitt Corporation, but felt he was too old to become a Vigilance League competitor, as he saw this famous sport of super-powered people fighting each other as a younger person's game. In the least, though, he had been able to use his Averitt Corporation discount to give his kids the privilege of having bond bands, which made Akaru feel that much worse about not wanting to use his anymore. Still, Akaru's first days partnering naturally with the stone golem Bayunite Hopalima were incredible. Akaru felt like this creature shared a brain with him. When not merged with Akaru, Hopalima could leap off the ground incredibly high for how heavy it was and slam its fists into the earth, sending a shockwave of rocks flying up, striking anyone nearby. Its tail could also strike the ground and create a wave of dirt and rocks in the direction of its aim. Akaru could essentially do these same things himself when Hopalima merged onto his body, but even more amplified. Hopalima's main form on him would be to alter his arms into much larger stone limbs. When Akaru used these arms to hurl himself into the air, he practically felt like he was flying. He trained in battles against Agama and his own naturally bonded Bayunite partner, Hodera. But Akaru rarely had the upper hand in these fights. As in sync as he felt with Hopalima, his connection was nothing like what Augie had with his ice-spewing Bayunite lizard partner. Anytime Akaru sent a shockwave through the dirt, Augie would freeze the ground beneath him or leap up and make an ice platform attached to the trees to slide around on, then zip in over the craters to attack Akaru and Hopalima. It was a bit frustrating to always lose, but it helped that Augie was a very encouraging winner. Maybe you can't beat me yet, Akaru, but I bet you'll be wrecking everyone at the school's vigilance team tryouts, especially people using bond bands like your sister. Unfortunately, just hearing Junko mentioned made Akaru worry. She would constantly echo their father's beliefs about bond bands and was possibly even more stubborn about them than he was. Plus, Akaru knew that most people at school had been upset with Augie for having a natural bond with a Bayunite, and Akaru didn't want to get the same looks and whispers. Thankfully, as if reading his mind, Augie asked Akaru how he felt about the two of them showing up with Bayunites, but without bond bands, to their school's vigilance tryouts. Akaru told him that he was scared of other people making fun of him or being mad at him, to which Augie simply replied, Why? Akaru said he wanted other people to like him, to which Augie asked, Why? Akaru said he guessed he didn't want to disappoint people and didn't want to be lonely. Well, do you feel like you're disappointing anyone right now? Or do you feel lonely right now? Augie asked, gesturing at the scene around them, the two boys sitting with their Bayunite partners having an amazing time in a beautiful forest. Akaru replied, No, I guess not. Not at all. Then Augie said, Exactly! And I bet you asked me to help you make a real bond with a Bayunite because something in your gut told you that I knew what was really what about Bayunites. I think your gut is closer to your soul than your head is. Your head will try to explain why you should do something that feels totally gross and wrong, then you do it and just feel terrible. But your gut doesn't tell you why something is right, it just knows. So what does your gut say about showing off your connection with Hopalima to the world? Akaru smiled slightly at Augie, then at his Bayunite partner. He said, I want to do it. 
I just want to bring Hopalima everywhere now, but I'm still, or I guess my head is still scared of what other people are going to say. Akaru was even worried just then that Augie would judge him for this, but as his gut was likely trying to tell him, that wasn't the case. Augie replied, That's fine to be worried, not everyone has as easy a time being themselves as I do, but I got an idea that's going to make it a lot easier for you to show up with Hopalima to the Vigilance tryouts. Plus, it's going to be super funny. A few days later, Augie and Hodera showed up at the Inner Talia Middle School Vigilance tryouts. Soon after, Akaru and Hopalima entered along with his sister Junko and her winged fire serpent Bayunite Ahimonyo. Both Junko and Akaru were wearing their bond bands. Junko saw Augie there and marched past him saying, You got lucky the first time you beat us, but I've been training and it's not gonna happen again. Augie just smiled. Just give me a good fight and I don't care what happens. She sneered and marched away. There were 32 potential vigilants there to train, and 19 of them had Bayunite partners. The rest were part of the 22.2% of people that are born with or eventually develop superpowers naturally. There would be a bracket tournament for the tryouts. Those who made it into the top 16 would get training after school with a registered Vigilance League coach, but only the top four would get to compete for the school in official tournaments. At this age, the Vigilance that had been born with their powers had significant advantages, as they'd been able to train with those powers for years and years. Akaru had only been bonded with Hopalima for a couple weeks. His goal was just to make the top 16, but Augie told him that with a real bond with a Bayunite, they would both be guaranteed to be the finalists, going up against each other. Which made Akaru feel even weirder about wearing his bond band. Now, when fighting in official vigilance competitions, since around 160 years ago, it became required for all to wear a device called a fortitude field. This is a dime-sized device that sits somewhere stuck on your head and creates an invisible field around a person that still allows them to feel pain from a strike, but prevents most lasting physical damage to their bodies. Throughout the fight, the invisible barrier just over your skin keeps track of all the hits you've taken, as well as your mental fortitude, through scanning your brainwaves. When someone has taken enough physical damage, their willingness to go on and their belief that they can win will dwindle. As a result, the fortitude field will let their consciousness start to slip, and they'll eventually fall unconscious. People used to be allowed to fight without them, but the number of severe injuries and deaths in official competitions was causing enough concerns that public interest in the sport was fading. The devices were controversial when first made, as the man who'd created them was a spiritual scientist who claimed the formula to make them came to him channeled from a higher power. Plus, he immediately made them freeware and let everyone know how to make them, despite getting multi-million dollar offers for exclusive rights to sell them. Now you can pick one up for 10 bucks or so at most sports stores, but they only work when within range of a grounded fortitude field beacon, so you can't just wear one everywhere you go and expect to never get hurt. Akaru, Junko, Augie, their Bayunites, and all the other competitors put on their fortitude fields and got ready for battle. Augie was put up first against one of the people considered to be the ringers of the whole contest, Levi Brutus. He didn't have a Bayunite, but had been born with the incredibly rare ability of telekinesis. He could levitate up to 300 pounds worth of really anything within 20 feet of his body, with the possibility for this to expand significantly with more training. Akaru was pretty sure the coach had put Augie up against this guy on purpose. The coach was a former Unitalia Vigilance League competitor who'd been sponsored by the Averett Corporation, and more than anyone, he probably wanted to see a kid partnered with a Bayou Knight naturally taken down fast. Unfortunately for him, Augie was ready for anything. Augie merged with Hodera from the very start and stayed well back from his opponent, making ice slides to scoot away any time Levi got close. Augie was clearly toying with Levi for a while and getting Levi pretty frustrated. Eventually, Brutus used his powers to crack the ground and lift stones and dirt out to hurl at Augie. Augie dove around some and made ice shields spring up from the ground to block others, though one did eventually smash through and managed to hit him. Levi was satisfied for only a second as Augie just laughed through the hit and seemingly decided it was finally time to fight back. He started shooting a constant beam of ice at Levi while sliding on a track he'd made around him. Levi was deflecting the ice and making it move around him on the edge of his telekinetic range, but as it moved to his back it was solidifying. Eventually, Augie had frozen Levi in a huge sphere of ice and kept building up the layer of ice on the outside around him. Then, Augie just sat back and watched. 
Through the hazy ice, everyone could see Levi trying to smash through, but the ice was too thick. Eventually, he just wore himself out without making any dents in the ice, and his fortitude fell to zero. The fight was Augie's. There was a crowd of students and parents watching, and the response was mixed. Some people clapped, some people booed, and some people just seemed to be looking at how others were reacting, unsure of what to do. It made Akru more scared of what was coming, which led to his first fight going a lot less smoothly than he'd hoped. Akru and Hopalima went up against another Bayou Knight vigilant named Camilla and her smoghound Bayou Knight, Uahelio. Akaru started off bonded with his Bayou Knight, but his opponent didn't. This was to be expected, as most Bond Band users tried to stay separated from their Bayou Knights for much of their fights, thinking their Bayou Knights were stronger without them. They'd simply command their creatures from afar, and just try to not get hit themselves. But that also made fighters like Camilla fairly easy to take out, if their Bayou Knight failed to protect them on even just one hit. Unfortunately for Akaru, Uahelia wasn't going to make it easy for him to hit its partner. As soon as the fight began, Uahelio howled and a plume of smoke burst from its mouth. It sprayed at Akaru to blind him, but also turned and blew a wave of it at Camilla, shrouding her in darkness. In a panic, Akaru just started swinging his stony fists around, trying to hit anything that might come close. He didn't know if it was an effect of the smoke, or just his own thoughts betraying him, but he started getting more and more scared of what would happen if this whole crowd learned he had made his connection with Hopalima without a bond band. He started thinking maybe he should just bail and keep people from finding out. And the more he did that, the more his strength and connection to Hopalima seemed to be fading. He was suddenly tackled from behind through the smoke, with the hound's teeth biting into his shoulder, then leaping away into the darkness. It didn't break the fortitude field, but it hurt as badly as if it had. The hound leapt in again and again. Akaru knew his fortitude was fading fast. Until, out of his own control, both his stony hands moved up gently onto his torso, one on his heart and one on his gut. He suddenly felt a wave of comfort and somehow knew this was Hopalima speaking to him, reassuring him. Before even knowing what he was doing, he swung an arm behind him and batted away the hound as it leapt towards him. His confidence started to rise. He knew that both Augie and Hopalima would still care about him regardless of how the crowd reacted to their plan, but if that plan was going to have the impact that they all wanted, Akaru needed to get his head in the game and win as many fights as possible. He pressed his hands to the ground, then used them to thrust himself into the air. He flew up through the smoke, but came right back down into it, slamming the ground and sending a shockwave out that blew back all the smog. Akaru saw through the swell of darkness, both Uahelio and Camilla flying back away from him. Akaru sprang over to Camilla, grabbed her, and raised her over his head, as if to slam her into the ground. He then stared at the approaching hound intently, and it kneeled, not wanting to see its partner harmed. Its fortitude dropped to zero, and it passed out. With no powers to fight with, Camilla surrendered. People cheered for Akaru much more than they had for Augie, seeing the bond band on him and assuming he was using it. From there, Akaru became much more confident, which strengthened his bond with Hopalima even more. Both he and Augie tore through the brackets, winning all their matches, until it came down to the final four. There was Augie, Akaru, a non-Bayunite vigilant named Barry Stafos, and Junko Inoue, Akaru's sister. Akaru was put up against Barry, who had a materialization ability to manifest floating bars around him that he could use as monkey bars to hurl himself around the arena with incredible acrobatic skills, or make the bars to use as weapons. It was a family ability that his older, eccentric cousin, Flamtatious Staphos, actually used in the American Vigilance League. Flamtatious even had the same agent as the current Global Vigilance champion, Freya Sparks, whose tactics Akaru was familiar with and sort of mimicked in his fight against Barry. Akaru had far better defensive skills than this acrobat, so he focused on blocking and staying in one place while his opponent tried flipping above and around him. Barry eventually wore himself out, and then Akaru went on the attack and quickly laid out his opponent, taking the win. He was happy about his victory and his place as one of the Intertalia Middle School Vigilants, but he also knew now he was closer to the big reveal, and he'd now have to watch Junko go up against Augie. His sister came over to him before the fight and told him 
You'd better cheer for me or nobody. You root for that weird little monster friend of yours, and you'll embarrass yourself and our whole family. In that moment, Akuru became terrified again of disappointing his dad and his sister, but quickly felt Hopalima brush its stony head under his hand, making him pet the creature. Quickly, that calmed him down. At least his dad wasn't there to see the big reveal, but he would have to find out about it eventually. Just before the fight began, while Junko wasn't looking, Akuru snuck over to Augie and said, Don't hold back, okay? I want Junko to really see what a real Bayunite bond can do. Augie nodded and smiled reassuringly, saying, Don't worry, buddy, whether it's today or later, we're gonna make sure she gets it. Junko and her Bayunite Ahimonyo had proven to be quite the pairing in that day's competitions, and she was more than eager to have a rematch with Augie after how easily he'd beaten her the last time they'd squared off. She also decided to start the fight already bonded to Ahimonyo, because she knew that's exactly what Augie would be doing, and she wanted to beat him at his own game. She had been studying Augie as he fought, but he'd just glanced in on her fights briefly, saying he wanted her fighting tactics to be a fun surprise. When bonded with her flame serpent, Junko essentially became a humanoid dragon. She had wings and a flame-lined tail that could fling fireballs out at her foes. They hit like bricks and made her enemy feel like they'd just gotten at least second-degree burns, quickly draining their fortitude. When the fight started, Augie began making a skating ring for himself to slide around on, but Junko quickly flew up above the arena and started blasting the rink full of holes, before targeting him directly. Augie put up an ice wall to block the first barrage of fire, but she'd anticipated that. The fire was blocked, but melted through enough of the ice to weaken it, and she tackled through it and shoulder-slammed Augie right in the head. It was the hardest hit he'd taken all day, but once again, just laughed, sliding off on his butt on the ice away from his foe. He then leapt up, but she shot at his feet and made it hard for him to keep sliding. Still, he bounded and flipped over the blast and just kept on going. Junko was faring better than any other Vigilant had against Augie, but the fight still looked to be in his favor. Until he caught Akuru's concerned gaze from the sidelines, Augie looked from Akuru up to Junko, then got an idea that he thought would make their plans even better. Augie suddenly slowed down, then glanced back at the Dragon Lady soaring in behind him. He had plenty of time to dodge, but soon got hit anyway and driven into the ground, cracking through his own ice. She then flew up holding him and hurled him down into the ground again. She was about to scorch him with flames when Augie yelled out, Oh no, she has beaten me, I can't go on, bleh. Then he lay down like he was unconscious. He stayed like that and after a few seconds, the coach called it. Junko had won, but was even more furious than if she'd lost. She tried to ignore her anger as people uncertainly clapped for her. She said, y you were just scared I was going to burn you up too bad. What, you can't take a little pain, you wimp? But Augie just leapt up and said, Sure, whatever you say. He marched over to Akuru, who looked just as confused as everyone else. What are you doing? You could have proved to everyone how much better a natural bond is. They're all going to think you're a coward or something now. Augie just smiled and slapped Akuru's shoulder. Chill out, I made the top four. I'm on the team. Besides, I don't care what they think. And now... You get to be the one to show them and your sis what a real bond can do. That was when it hit Akuru. Now he wasn't in the finals against Augie. He was going up against Junko. Just before the battle, Akuru was standing near his sister, but not saying anything. He knew what he was about to do in this fight was going to infuriate her, but he was set on doing it anyway. Until a heavy hand dropped onto his shoulder. I'm proud of you two, Akuru's father said. The man was supposed to be at work. Akuru had no idea he'd been there. You had me worried for a while, son, with all your talk of being like that silly Agama boy. You don't need him as an influence over your actions, and your skills today have proven that. Akuru's heart pounded hearing his father's voice. His old man thought he was using the bond band to partner with Hopalima, even though Akuru had never technically said that. The stony Bayunite actually started snarling angrily at Akuru's father, as if sensing the boy's anxiety. His father angrily glanced down at the creature. Then his eyes fell on Akuru's wrist. Pay attention, son, you've accidentally turned off your bond band. But Akuru stepped away from his dad and said, No, I haven't. He didn't look back and walked out onto the field with Hopalima. His sister took the other side, having heard what he'd just said, piecing together what was going on and leering at Akuru furiously, shaking her head as if demanding he not do anything stupid. 
Akuru was nervous as he fused with Hopalima, but he caught Augie's gaze on the sidelines and that, paired with his heart melding with that of his Bayou Knight, set him at ease. It was time for the reveal. Just before the fight began, Akru pulled off his bond band, held it in the air, then tossed it aside, starting the crowd muttering angrily. Junko's eyes started smoking in fury. The bell rang and the fight was on. She shot into the air, but so did Akru, flinging off his hands right into her path. She swooped up to dodge him, but he grabbed her tail with his stony hand and dragged her back down to the ground as he fell. He slammed her onto her back, then jumped away just before smashing his fist into the dirt, making a wave of rocks explode up from beneath her, hurling her into the air again. She tried to regain her composure, but before she could, he once again flung himself up and grabbed both of her wings, pulling her back down. He put both wings in one hand and grabbed her tail in the other and held her above his head. She thrashed to try and free herself, but couldn't. Akaru looked out at the confused crowd, then over to his surprisingly expressionless father. Finally, though, he glanced over at Augie again, who was cackling and cheering wildly at Akaru's skills and the crowd's confusion. Akaru smirked and faced the crowd again, yelling, Bonban connections can't beat the real thing. I made Hopalima my friend the proper way, and other people should try it too. His sister suddenly split away from her Bayunite, fell to the ground, and punched Akaru in the stomach. He keeled over slightly and released Ahimonyo. Junko yelled for it to roast him, and it spat a beam of flames at her brother. He felt the pain of being scorched, but jumped through it with his face covered, and instinctively, with Hopalima's help, snatched the snake's head and held it closed. He slammed it to the ground and clapped his hand down onto it, sending a shockwave across the arena. Junko was rolled away by the blow, but quickly leapt up to see that her ally was out cold. With no Bayunite partner for her to fight with, the battle was over. Akaru had won the whole competition by fighting his way with an authentic Bayunite bond. The crowd's reaction was, again, mixed, but Akaru didn't notice much as Augie ran over quickly, leapt up, and gave Akaru a big tackle hug. Despite the confusion and the fury from their new coach, the four Vigilance team winners were announced, with Akaru at the lead, followed by Junko, Augie, and Barry. The crowd even seemed to start clapping more as the uncertainty of it all died down a bit, and plenty of people were posting about it online, how two Bond Band free Bayunite Vigilance had just bested a few dozen other competitors. Akaru had assumed his dad had left, but as the crowd was dispersing, the man marched back onto the scene and came up to Akaru and Augie, looking stern. He asked, So that entire time you were fighting without the use of your band? Akaru nodded, Yes, sir. And am I right to assume you made the bond with this Bayunite without it? He nodded again. How long did it take you to make a genuine connection? Akaru replied, Just a couple months of hanging out with Augie in the woods. Anyone can do it, just like Augie says. We don't need the bands. Dai Inoue turned to Augie, staring skeptically at the boy. Before his face softened slightly, Anyone can do it, you say? Is age a factor? Augie smiled. Nope, just open-mindedness. And at that, a slight but warm and hopeful smile came across the once stern man's face. I hope you enjoyed this fifth episode of Vigilance, and make sure to subscribe if you want to see the next chapter of Akaru and Agama's story, where I'll likely be drawing Junko and her Bayunite. There's four other episodes in the series so far, including yesterday's episode about Chadwick Gygar, a tanky fighter who realized he needed to learn some new tricks. That and another episode are linked on screen.